In this lecture, we'll be looking at Fukuzawa Yukichi's understanding of history. One thing that's interesting about the relationship between the United States and Japan is that the United States essentially has credit for forcing Japan to open its doors to the modern world. Uh, this American, Commodore Perry, in 1853, is going to lead a flotilla of ships to Japan and say, open up your country to trade, to diplomatic uh, relationships with the United States and other countries, or we're going to blow you up, basically. And he could keep this promise because he had several advanced sh ships um, with modern cannon, and the uh, he w had pulled into Edo Bay, which is where modern-day Tokyo is, and it's the capital of Japan, and uh, that's mostly made of paper and wood, so he just needed to fire a few cannonballs into the area, and he would have set it all on fire, basically. So he was able to force Japan to open its doors. And this led to a very kind of complex reaction within Japan, or I should say reactions. But for our purposes, basically this showed just how powerful the West was. And for some Japanese people, and even the same Japanese person, this meant the West was kind of a threat. But also, that power had kind of an allure. Americans could do things the Japanese couldn't. And Western people could do things the Japanese couldn't. So maybe we can learn from them. Maybe we can make our country better through them. And uh, just as an aside, you can see how there was this struggle. I mean, this is a pretty good uh, Japanese imitation of Perry. Uh, some drawings depicted him as a um, demon, but here they're trying to take him seriously. This painting of him, this is a pretty good likeness, though they did must understand what we mean by blue eyes, right? You can see here the, the artist who drew this um, when he was told his eyes were blue, uh, did not get the right part blue. <laughs> but like I said, for many Japanese, the Americans were scary. And I think it's interesting, this is a Japanese rendition of one of the American ships, which emphasizes, I think, the fearsome nature of these ships and how they posed a danger to Japan. So what's going to happen is in 1868, a group of radical reformers will seize power in Japan, and these are people who are will eventually be interested in radically transforming Japan into a modern nation. But it's interesting because in doing their efforts to do this, they put the emperor back in power. Or at least they say they're putting the emperor back in power, uh, known as the Meiji Emperor. And um, in 1868, they seize power. They put him back into power. And so these modernizing samurai take control of Japan. They want to make Japan modern. And you can kind of see this in these two images of the Meiji Emperor. This is him, I believe, in 1866 in traditional Japanese clothing. And here is he is a few years later dressed as a Western monarch would in a military uniform, not with a curved samurai sword, but a cavalry saber. There's a sword here too, by the way, but it, and it's curved. It's kind of traditional Japanese sword, but notice it's down here um, on this uh, stool, whereas here he's holding it. But now these modernizing samurai have taken control. They've restored the emperor to power, this ancient symbol of Japan. But they want to make modern changes. So there's this kind of dichotomy, right? We're looking to the ancient past, restoring this ancient ruler to power, and order to bring modernity. So this whole thing, the Meiji Restoration, brings up important historical questions, and there's a need for a historical narr narrative to answer them. So what do I mean by this? First of all, why is the West so darn powerful? Why is it that with just a few ships, they can come to our country and force us to open up? Why is the West so powerful? How can we become as powerful as the West so that we don't suffer colonization? The Japanese knew that uh, many countries had been taken over by the Western powers. One reason Japan was willing, in a sense, to open to the West was because they knew that about a decade before Perry came, the British had fought China in the Opium War, and the Chinese lost. So the Japanese realized that if they didn't become powerful like the West, they might suffer colonization. So it's not a thing like, oh, we can just ignore them. We can't. We need to become powerful like them 
And not only, though, was it just to avoid colonization, the Japanese are very patriotic, and they said, we want to become a first-rate nation. We don't want to just stay free. We want to become a great country, as powerful as those Western countries. Maybe we'll have some colonies ourselves. But here's the problem. That means becoming like the West, right? If we, the West is powerful and we want to avoid being colonized, then we kind of have to become like the West. So how can we do that while maintaining our identity, right? If we dress like Western people and act like Western people, do we cease being Japanese? And if we cease being Japanese, didn't we just get colonized anyway? How do we become powerful like the West while still keeping our identity? Well, a man who would provide a very powerful answer to that and help guide Japan in this process of modernization, and he would use history to do this, that's why we're talking about him, was a man named Fukuzawa Yukichi. Uh, Fukuzawa Yukichi was a lower-ranked samurai. He was a Dutch interpreter. Uh, the Japanese basically only had relationships with one Western country for a couple hundred years, the Netherlands, so he learned Dutch. But later, he would learn English and start to dress like this. And you can see this kind of transformation. And in a sense, are you still Japanese? Would you undergo this tra transformation, right? You stop wearing Japanese traditional clothing and you dress like a Western person. Are you still Japanese? So Fukuzawa Yukichi had to wrestle with these questions. So the first question, right? How do we become powerful? Well, Fukuzawa Yukichi studied Western history. In some of his books he, he mentioned uh, that he wrote for Japanese people, he makes mention of, oh yeah, I referred to this French historian Guzot. You should read his book. He's really good. So he studied Western history. And as he studied the Western history, he came to understood, you know what? Western people weren't always so advanced. They once were like we are now, right? They once were like we are now. So it's not like these Western people are somehow inherently superior to us. They used to be like us. So that means if they changed, we can change too. If they progressed and developed, we can too. So that's the first thing he argues. What happened? Well, the West discovered civilization. And the West, after discovering civilization, acted in accordance with civilization and so became very powerful. Well, what then is civilization? And Fukuzawa Yukichi, very clear-thinking guy, he gives a definition. The refinement of knowledge and the cultivation of virtue so as to elevate human life to a higher plane. Now, what does he mean by this? He's basically talking about science broadly understood. That's what he means by the refinement of knowledge. Cultivation of virtue, he means things like being diligent, um, be working hard, uh, that sort of uh, being thinking about the group, not just thinking as an individual, kind of traditional in many ways, uh, Confucian ideology, really. But I want to focus on the refinement of knowledge, right? Science broadly understood. So it wouldn't just be like biology and chemistry. It would also be things like sociology and, and, and of course, history. He said, Western people discovered science, like I said, broadly understood and that was a part of this whole package of civilization. And based on science and civilization, Western people transformed their political, social, and economic systems. And we can do it too. Right? We can do it too. And one thing, for example, he basically argues is that more freedom is more civilized than less freedom. So he tells this story of Western countries as a kind of progress towards freedom. Doesn't that sound a lot like some of those English historians? Remember the Whigs? Whig historians? He's borrowing from them. He looked at British and French history and said, okay, the British and the French are going towards more and more freedom. And that gave them power. Right? So there's this kind of idea that through understanding better the laws that govern the world which is what science helps us to understand, science broadly understood, if we live according to those laws, we can be more like the West, which is really powerful. And 
more freedom is more civilized and less freedom, we should have more freedom. And Japan, it should be pointed out, will adopt a constitution, will adopt democracy based on these ideas. People with more freedom can develop democracy. Why is that a good thing? In democracies, people are active citizens who work together to make their country stronger. So he's drawing this connection between civilization, which means being virtuous and having knowledge, and enacting and developing society, politics, and the economy according to that advanced knowledge. And when you do that, you become powerful. Democracies, by giving people more freedom, makes them work actively to make together to make the country stronger. They don't just pay taxes, right? They do more than that. They take part in national affairs. When there is a problem, they volunteer their services. Instead of having a few samurai in your army, you can have hundreds of thousands of citizen soldiers. So in democracy, people are actively, people are given freedom, but they use that freedom according to virtue to work together to make their country stronger. Economic freedom leads to the development of the country's economy. Uh, Fukuzawa Yukichi in his books goes on and on about how people, when they have the freedom to engage in business, are naturally going to try and become wealthier. That develops the economy. And when you have a strong economy, when the country's richer, you can have a strong army. And that's a traditional uh, idea in East Asia, Chinese saying, rich country, strong army. If you have a good economic foundation, you can have a powerful army. And we can get that strong economic foundation by encouraging capitalism. Encouraging trade, both domestic and international. Freedom, in economic terms, helps to make the country stronger. And civilization tells us that freedom's a good thing. And it's going to make our country stronger so we can stay independent. Right? I've been talking about how Fukuzawa Yukichi is arguing, you know, we need to go through this kind of progress, accept this kind of civilization like the Westerners, and then we can become powerful too. Well, he stressed following civilization is not following Western civilization. He argues civilization was discovered in the West first, but that doesn't make it Western. The Westerners were the ones that figured out these rules, these scientific laws that govern the economy, politics, society, they discovered them, but the laws are there. They don't belong to Western people. Western people didn't create and invent the laws. They're just there as a part of nature. So we can follow those laws while still staying Japanese because those laws are not Western. Having a capitalist economy, having a democracy, those aren't Western things. Western people discovered them first, but they don't own them. They didn't invent them. It's just the way the world works. It's just like saying that Isaac Newton owns gravity because he discovered it. No, he doesn't. That's just the way things work. He discovered it, but that doesn't make it his. Right? So civilization was discovered in the West first. It's not Western civilization. So we can imitate it without ceasing being Japanese. Right? Accepting universal civilization is just fine. There's no such thing as French math or English science. It is just how the world works. And those are just the people that described it first. It doesn't mean they own it. And he will write in one of his books, Japan's uniqueness lies only in the fact that she has preserved national polity intact from earliest antiquity, has never been deprived of her sovereignty by a foreign power. So what Fukuzawa Yukichi will do, I know that can be a little complex to understand, but what he's saying is we're unique in that we have never been conquered and we've always had the same dynasty of emperors ruling us. Right. In Chinese history, remember we talked about the Mandate of Heaven, how there were different Chinese dynasties that ruled. And when they started doing a bad job, Heaven would transfer its the right to rule to another family in a new dynasty. In Japan, they just have one dynasty. So what Fukuzawa Yukichi is arguing is, we are free to accept Western civilization because it's not really Western civilization. It is universal civilization. It's just the way things work. It will make our country strong. And we'll stay Japanese. And being Japanese, of course, is not threatened by adopting these Western ideas because we still haven't been conquered by anyone. We're still ruled by the same dynasty. And in fact, accepting this new civilization will prevent us from being conquered by anyone and will help us preserve our natural national identity. So far from threatening 
our identity, adopting so-called Western uni uh, civilization will not hurt us at all. It will make us stronger, and we will stay, still stay Japanese. The emperor is the emperor no matter how he dresses. And this was wildly successful. And I use this image. This is the Japanese emperor receiving the Order of the Garter, a British a, um, um, a British a, uh, award, similar to being knighted. And he's receiving that here. And that shows how Japan has become a part of the so-called modern world. Right? This succeeded very well. And it's interesting that in the 1930s, when Japan departed from the idea of universal civilization, that's when we start getting into their actions that lead to World War II and their conquest by the United States. So Fukuzawa Yukichi was onto something, right? And I just want to stress, Japan faced a very difficult situation. It needed to figure out how to maintain its identity while still undergoing modernization. And Fukuzawa Yukichi developed a very influential historical story that explained how that could be done. So hurrah for history, or rather, should I say, bonsai for history. <laughs>